Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. We've got a ton of news concerning graphics cards in today's video. And I want to begin with AMD and the Narve 22 Silicon, which has been commonly thought to power the RX 6700 and 6700 XT. The specifications associated with this GPU have been 40 compute units with the 6700 vanilla, I'm cutting things down a little to just 36 compute units, and 12 gigabytes of VRAM, which naturally means we've got a 192-bit bus. Well, one of my sources has actually gotten back to me concerning this, and they've been pretty reliable in the past concerning previous RDNA 2 information. With that said, I've only managed to confirm it with one source at the moment. I generally prefer to confirm it with at least two, but I'm reporting this anyway um, because I suspect we're going to get uh, official confirmation fairly soon anyway, one way or the other. Anyway, um, so yes, that information that I just mentioned, 40 compute units, is... Uh, I'm told anyway, accurate for the 6700 XT and 12 gigabytes of VRAM, again with 192-bit um, bus. The Infinity Cache is definitely 96 megabytes, at least that's what I'm told for both SKUs. But I know what you're going to say, okay, what about performance, dude? And what about pricing? Well, I've got you covered there. So these SKUs essentially are going to be replacing the RX 5700 series, so of course that's the 5700 and 5700 XT. And I was told that performance is definitely better than the GPUs they're replacing, and they do also support hardware-based ray tracing, and when AMD finally released the update, which may actually coincide about the same time anyway as uh, the release of these cards, we'll get uh, AMD's version of DLSS, which uh, they're of course referring to Infinity FX Super Sampling, just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, so this silicon will support that, uh, but as for performance, I'm told that we're looking at probably about 20%-ish faster than the 5700 XT, although there are outliers, of course, and some titles will definitely do a little better. Now, I'm actually surprised that the performance isn't higher. I mean, if you asked me to throw a dart at the board, I would have said it was more like 25% to 30%. Yes, the clock frequencies aren't that much higher, but you do have RDNA 2, which has a drastic IPC gain, but nevertheless, I was told that it seems to be around the 15 to 20% mark on average. So, of course, that might just be all of the different resolutions, and they're just kind of throwing those all together, and some resolutions or some games may be dragging things down based upon internal benchmarks. So, do take that with a grain of salt, but that's what I'm told. So it seems that the 5700 XT is going to be outperformed by the 6700 XT by about 20%, and then the 6700 Vanilla is going to be about on par with the 60, with the sorry, with the 5700 XT, maybe slightly slower. Um, so again, that's fairly impressive given what I'm about to say in regarding the price point. And AMD seem to be very aggressive with the pricing. I'm told that. Currently, the idea for AMD is to continue their strategy of undercutting NVIDIA by a decent chunk of change. So I'm hearing it's going to be about 50 bucks cheaper than the RTX um, 3060 Ti. So we could be seeing these cards on store shelves, from US dollar prices, at around the four, uh, sorry, three, I was about to say 449. I was like, wait, that doesn't sound right at around the 349 US dollar mark. Now, this may be give or take a few pennies, depending on obviously market conditions and all of that jazz, but so far AMD are considering putting the cards out at just 349. That, of course, is for the 6700 XT. To my understanding, the 6700 Vanilla is still going to retain 36 compute units, so it's basically the same cut in CU as we see with the 5700 and 5700 XT but this card is going to retail at uh, perhaps around the 299 mark, which I think is kind of that magical figure. I think there's a huge difference with a customer when they're looking at a product between 299 and 309, for example. Maybe that's just me, but I do think there's that like magical price barrier. So I think that AMD will do fairly well with these cards, and it seems that their strategy, of course, is to slightly undercut what NVIDIA are charging with the RTX 3060 Ti, NVIDIA do have other SKUs incoming, like the 3060, as well as the 3050 series. 
but how well they perform depending on the cuts and the cuda claws well that's an entirely different question indeed interestingly i was also given a tiny bit of information about narve 23 and 24 uh, from another source but it's not that much at the moment i should get more info on those two gpus or you know uh, uh, pretty soon but what i'm told is that narve 24 could possibly be even cheaper um there, there's a bit of confusion at the moment because one of my sources told me that Narve 23 is going to go all the way down, you know, all the way downtown. And another source told me that, no, that's not the case. Narve 24 is going to be the GPU, which is essentially going to replace Polaris. And it could be around the 150 US dollar mark. And as you can probably imagine, the actual GPU itself is fairly small. Now, interestingly, I've actually had two people tell me about this. So maybe it's true. Um... One thing I am hearing is that the lower end RDNA 2 does not have hardware based ray tracing, which I guess makes sense given the absence of performance at this point. Although I can't be sure about it because it doesn't take up a massive amount of die area. I imagine it still will have some type of upsampling technology though, um, which of course would make a ton of sense for. Uh, the GPU to have upsampling at a lower performance. I'm also told that the amount of IC on these GPUs, Infinity Cache, is quite small. Um, we're looking at possibly 32 or 64 megabytes. Also, a very small update to Apple. Um, and this concerns a story that uh, actually was doing the rounds a couple of days ago. And that is that Apple, of course, have been producing their own silicon for a while now. And we've seen it in M1. The ARM-based M1 actually is fairly impressive, at least power consumption-wise. It puts out decent performance and does feature up to eight GPU cores. And there was a story during the rounds that we're going to see uh, much higher core count CPUs and GPUs from Apple. Well, I actually got um, a source that uh, messaged me about this. I kind of did some, uh, let's say, research with people and kind of poked them a little bit. And I did hear that this story is indeed true, but they gave me a little bit more context. I'm told that the 64-core mobile GPU, so I just want to stress that word, mobile GPU, so for laptops and so on, those are not going to be on sale, uh, you know, in the early part of the next year by any stretch of the imagination. It could possibly be like late first half or early second half of next year. I'm not exactly sure on the release timings yet, honestly. But I was told that the performance is actually really good. And by really good, I mean really, really good. Um, according to what one source told me, the claims that have been going around that these things are actually as, as impressive as, say, uh, some of AMD's current high-end GPUs is true. In fact, I was told that the mobile GPUs from Apple can actually keep up with high-end desktop GPUs, current GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD. So to be clear, I mean, for example, let's say the 6800 uh, XT from, uh, from AMD would be about the same speed as what Apple's GPU is. There are some caveats there. I don't know what those tests are. So is it gaming focused or would it be more something like compute? Because if it's something like compute, I could imagine that's true. I really could. And just a small extra little thing, I was also told that um, there are server GPUs coming in from Apple as well, and they will indeed go up to 128 cores, but I have next to no information about that, so I'm just going to leave that right there. Switching to Intel, yes, Intel, don't forget, are creating uh, discrete GPUs, and Intel are very keen to remind us about this. Raja Kodori recently took to Twitter and gave a small tease for the upcoming XC-based GPUs. There's not a whole load of information here that we didn't already know before. Obviously, Intel are creating the XC as kind of a scalable GPU architecture, so it's tile-based. This is not unique to Intel. We know future AMD GPUs and NVIDIA GPUs, RDNA 3 and most likely Hopper seem to be the candidates from both respective companies. They will also take a similar approach. But Raja Kodori did also state that we are entering a quote, golden age of GPUs. And I actually believe him. I, I actually fully agree with what Raja has to say. 
He also um, praised Intel, NVIDIA, and other companies too for what we've actually been seeing in the marketplace. And, you know, kudos to uh, Raja. I think, I think graphics technology has definitely evolved really quickly over the past few years. And I don't just mean because of things such as hardware-based ray tracing. Upsampling, I think, is a silver bullet to many of the issues that we've been facing. Also, much more efficient usage of uh, rendering pipelines with things like primitive shaders. Um, and obviously, we've got variable rate shading, much more efficient in those areas. Uh, GPUs, in terms of compute, have also just skyrocketed in performance. And I think that the next few years, we'll definitely see quite a a difference in how GPUs perform. I think that Ampere and RDNA 2, they're not bad architectures, please don't get me wrong, and I'm definitely not saying RDNA 2 or Ampere are, you know, not exciting or anything like that. They are awesome architectures, and if you look at the leap, you know, RDNA um, from Polaris, it was like doink, and then you've got RDNA 2, which is an, also a doink, but um, I think RDNA 3 is also going to be very performant. I think that... Um, I think we're going to see some really cool stuff coming to the market over the next couple of years. And Intel, they've been getting their butts kicked on the CPUs, as we all know. However, I am hopeful on the GPUs. I don't know how competitive they'll be on the first generation, much like AMD, for example, with hardware-based ray tracing. Like, they're okay. It's not that they're awful, but um, they're about on par with Turing, which, of course, is kind of what we expected. Um, however... I do think Intel have the financial backing, the resources, and um, the expertise to make something really special for gaming. And, of course, also high-performance computing and other, and other areas. For me, the question isn't whether Intel can do this stuff. Um, it's whether they will execute it and follow through until we actually have a product which is working. Um, I spoke to some of Intel's graphics teams before. Uh, obviously, I went to GDC uh, last year, which feels oh so long ago now. Um, and, you know, I, I even spoke to Raja, funnily enough, and he, you know, I can tell the passion in the guy. The issue for me is whether Intel will continue to follow through, whether they will continue to get the funding. I'm hoping that the answer is yes, because... I want more competition in graphics. I think that we're going to need it. I think that it's only going to benefit us as customers. And if you think of it uh, in a very black and white way, Intel, technically speaking, have the largest market share of GPUs because of the iGPUs, of course, on their um, on the Intel processors. The problem is that whether they can kind of pull that expertise into a large GPU, which is high performance, decent power consumption, great drivers, and I will say that Intel's driver teams are actually pretty damn good. We've been seeing tons of uh, updates from them recently. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, hold the banner out for Intel yet. Um, they've got an awful lot to prove. I do think they've got the, I, I think they've got the talent, and I think that they've, technically speaking, got the resources. It's whether all of that stuff can come together. Um, and given there is a lot of infighting at the moment and PR stuff behind the scenes at Intel, that's what's concerning me. It's not the technical expertise of Raja or anyone in his team. It's the kind of infighting and the, the jousting that's been going on. So hopefully, like, I would love it um, because I just want more competition. But I'm going to finish this video off with one final story, and this is the RTX 3080 Ti. Courtesy credit goes to Copa D7 Kimmy for actually tweeting about this, but we actually have the RTX 3080 Ti's um, device ID, and now the drivers, or rather listings of the drivers, have now started to pop up in operating systems as well. Interestingly, while originally I thought that the RTX 3080 Ti was going to be seen in January, Someone more recently has told me that it's probably not going to be January that we see the RTX 3080 Ti. And I'm actually hearing it could even slip until February or possibly March, with more likely um, scenario being February. And I'm hoping that this is not the case. Obviously, I would love it for it to be earlier. The RTX 3080 Ti is basically an RTX 3090 
with small cuts to the memory system. So of course we're looking at just 20 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory, but the same number of CUDA cores. Also, since I mentioned the word GDDR6X, it also reminds me of another story that's been doing the rounds and I covered it a few days ago and I just wanna quickly briefly mention it in this video as a small update. So there's a story again actually from Cal Cutland that a big reason for the shortages of uh, graphics cards is GDDR6. And I'm pretty damn convinced at this point that that is not the case. Um, I've had two sources now tell me that it's not true and both of those sources have been ultra reliable in the past, like very reliable, that's all I'll say. But I was also talking to Charlie on Semi Accurate, it's a very brief uh, Twitter exchange, it wasn't like a you know, super in-depth conversation, and his info also said that it's not GDDR6. That information is incorrect. And I'm told that the volume of GDDR6 and 6x memory is actually really high that is not a reason for the shortages at all uh, one of my sources told me that it is a lot of reasons one of them is just simply that gpu production takes you know well it de does depend but generally speaking around three to four months so for nvidia for example there's a good chance that they just under well, they just didn't think how high the production or how high the demand would be. But I am hearing that there is another reason for NVIDIA, but I can't quite find out what it is yet. Um, as for AMD, I also think there's a multitude of different reasons. I think one of them is that um, TSMC are basically at capacity. With NVIDIA, um, they're obviously not using TSMC for production, but... Um, I, I don't think it's GDDR6X is the or GDDR6, which is the culprit. I was told that, you know, it's probably, A, they um, didn't think that the demand was going to be as high as it was, and obviously GPUs take a while in terms of manufacturing to ramp up production. But I also think that there's something else there, and we recently had the CFO of NVIDIA say that they're having shortages of parts and those reasons as well, but... Yeah, I think that there is more to the story. I just don't know exactly what it is. And for AMD, I think it's a multi. I think it's just multiple factors with AMD, not not least of which being the TSMC servered NM production just being absolutely tapped to the maximum because of the next generation consoles, and obviously they're also making CPUs for servers and all of this other stuff. So I think it's not just one thing, and I'm pretty certain that memory. If it is a part of it, it's a really small part of it, but I'm fairly certain that it's not really the story. With all of that said, though, thank you very much for watching the video. The normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.